Yeah. Yeah. So how, how's, uh, how's everyone? Good, thanks. How are you? Good, yeah, thank good. you. Good. Have you had a good week? Great week. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so just while, again, while we're waiting for, for people to log on to join in, we've got, um, I think we've got about 20 people today, which is really cool. Um, hello. <laughs> um, let's have a bit of a recap of last week. So maybe through chat or just through, uh, through shouting out. Um, just let's have a maybe go around one at a time. Um, just share something you remember uh, from last week. I don't know how we manage this, so maybe just shout out. And... I'll go down the list. Okay. So, Leslie Ann, you're up first. Um, soil diversity. Uh huh. Thank you. Uh, Helen? That was a week ago. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's why we're asking you to remind us what we did. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's rainy again. It must be Friday. <laughs> I know. I know. So last week, I'll give you, it was, um, the theme was planting. So if there's anything you remember about what we talked about planting. Oh, yeah. Skills, skills. skills and there we go. And that's, um, I put that there, sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, on yarn. Just... Oh, you're on mute, yarn. Sorry, 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 guys. Basically, yeah, the importance of healthy soil and using organic produce as a bedrock for the garden because unless the soil is healthy, then later on we're just catching up, but you know, we're not fixing the root of the problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Joy. Okay. Um, I remember you saying that doing the planting and talking about planting in threes and um, also you said that if things were a big seed you could plant them straight into the soil which was very depressing because I just planted a whole lot of peas into little trays but I've now <laughs> planted, I've transplanted all my peas and they seem to be hanging in there so I'm feeling a little bit okay about it. <laughs> Fantastic. It doesn't hurt to put do them in trays first, um, but you can put them straight in if you want. So, mm. yeah. Makes sense to do something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay, and Lisa. Um, I remember you were talking about um, social distancing for plants so that you, the pests can't find them all in one go. You, so you plant, plant them separately, not, not all in one row, and the pests can just munch along the row. Yeah, nice. I like the context you put that in as well. <laughs> Was there anybody else at last week's workshop that wants to say something they remember? And I also remember that plants work together um, to sustain each other. So it's really important to plant a whole variety of things. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Um, well, welcome and thank you everyone for joining us at our latest PermaV Live workshop. So all the new people, we're here at the Raymond Community Centre and inside the Permaculture Interpretive Garden. This site was handed over to the community, which the council looks after, about 15 years ago. And <laughs> all the gardens and food forest and bush tucker trails and everything that exists here has been built up over the last 15 years. And um, 
We're very fortunate because we've got Steve who designed the gardens where we get um, that history and expertise right with us. This is Gadigal and Bidjigal land that we're on, so we want to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. And as I introduced, we've got Steve Batley here. And behind the camera, thank you very much, we've got Barb Lewis <laughs> with her fingers. And um, she um, is also one of our permabits. Very fantastic. Now, again, for people um, who might be a little bit new, we will, you can use the chat function. You'll see in Zoom, there's the ability to write chat. So feel free during it to uh, write questions because while Steve's talking, I'll be monitoring the chat. I might be able to interrupt him at some point with a particularly pertinent question. At other times during the workshop, you'll be able to just speak out loud. Um, also be aware that there's a mute and unmute function. And sometimes it might be useful for you to be on gallery view, and that's usually in the top right. Um, so you might be, want to swap between speaker view and gallery view. Now we do each week invite people to submit a question to be um, answered during the workshop. Now, due to all sorts of technical things, what we're going to be doing is having them available for you on Instagram. So uh, just about half an hour ago, I did send all of you a link via email to the Instagram um, URL. So you can watch those videos there, but we will refer to them uh, this week. And from future weeks, just know that they will be there so you can preview them ahead of time um, from any, any time at all, rather than just waiting to half an hour beforehand. Um, so yeah, I'll hand over to Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Julian. Um, yeah, so this this week and next week and the week after, we're, we're covering a thing uh, that we call pest management. So how do we manage uh, how do we manage critters in our garden to to minimise you know, the damage that they cause and maximise the produce that we get uh, without without resorting to um, chemicals, I guess. Uh, so it's we're doing it over three weeks because it's actually quite complex there's a lot lot of different layers to it there's a lot of different strategies uh, but we're going to start off uh, with the overarching uh, philosophies and the overarching theme um, which is the same as the overarching theme for the last couple of weeks and will be the same overarching theme for the next 20 years which is that idea of uh, using nature and working with nature rather than against it and uh, looking at the ecosystem um, uh, the dynamics of the ecosystem, building a healthy, diverse ecosystem uh, to produce some really good outcomes. So that's 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 where we're taking you. Um, so this week, so we did, we got a couple of videos. Thanks to Andrew for sending in a video of his tomato plants with, um, and really worth checking out. It's actually quite interesting. A really nice shot of of uh, a little insect called white fly that lives on the tomatoes that really get white flies. It's just one of those things. Um, and Andrew is wondering how he can, what can he do in his garden to, to, to manage those. Uh, and was it um, Amanda uh, sent a great video of her garden that is being eaten by something uh, we think or she thinks is some sort of rodent. So rats or mice or maybe possums. So how do, how do you manage that? Um, and in an urban context, that's that is one of the challenges. Those bigger bigger critters that are going to come and eat everything. So, so I think, yeah. So we'll start we'll start the process, and maybe over time um, we'll come up with answers to both of those, and maybe we'll, we'll hopefully come up with some answers or some solutions to your pest management problem or problems uh, as well. So uh, I want to start uh, with thinking about. What, what actually is a pest? Um, so we'll explore the things that will come and live in your garden and, and then we'll chat about how we can, how we can um, sort of deal with them. So bear with me for one second. We're going to... Have I already seen... Okay, is that... Is that, yeah, that picture's on everyone's screen? Yep, really good. Yep, okay. 
All right. So the process will go through. I'll, I'll flick up some pictures and I'll get you guys to shout it if you recognize. Does anyone recognize what, what these are? Up saying aphids. Aphids, yes. yes. So they're aphids. Uh, really common. Just about every garden will have aphids either now or at some stage. Uh, they're, they're only a couple of millimeters long. Now they are. Uh, does anyone know what aphids do? Yeah, yeah they're sap, sap sucking. Yeah, what's going on? Um, oh, there we go. Um, so they're a sap sucker. They they come onto your new the new growth. I'm not sure which. I'm not, are we still on here? No. Okay. Um, anyway, so so they they're the little insects. They they come on mass. You get millions. Seems like millions of them, and they they love the new growth of plants. So they'll well, generally. You'll find them on you know, rosebuds and all sorts of plants, and they're a pest. They're a sap sucker, so they're feeding off, off the plants. So and and what? Yeah. All right. So next one. Does anyone recognise these guys? Is that scale? scale that's scale. Insect? Yes, that's right, Jan. So they're a um, a little insect, and they build this kind of little igloo over the top of themselves to protect them from from predators and they just live inside that and again they suck the sap out of uh, the plant often on the stems sometimes on the leaves but again they're really really common um, now here's a good one does anyone recognize this critter is that thrip thrips no it's hard uh, it's yeah it's so it's about i think they're about half a centimeter long if you saw that on your plant, what's your gut reaction? What would you do? Away <laughs> from it. Feel free to use chat yeah. as, a, as a list. Yeah, there we go. Yep, chat or call out. I'd keep away from it. Let it, it be. Let it be. Yeah. Keep away from it. Yeah. It's probably not a bad idea, judging by the pincers on the front of it. So this guy is actually one of the what we call one of the good guys, or one of the good bugs, or a predator. Oh. So it's um, it's a lacewing larvae, and it eats aphids and eats scale and eats moths and eats white flies. So I don't know if Andrew's here, but there's one of your your guys that will help you with your white fly. Unfortunately, they're not big enough to eat rats, but um, you know. It's, all right, so is that, you might have seen these things around the place, often in really random spots, like you might find them on the side of a chair, or I saw them once on my car tire. Um, these, has anyone seen one of these flying? Yeah, yeah, these are pretty common. They fly, you'll often see them at nighttime flying around the around your lights outside. Um, does anyone know what they are? Lace wings, yeah, so they're the adults. So there's the eggs, the larvae, and the adults of the lace wing. So if you've got these in your garden, fantastic. These guys are going to help you um, clean up a lot of your a lot of your insect pests that are eating your plants. And there's one, the, <laughs> that's a very fat lace wing larvae chowing down on an aphid, so yeah. Um, these are pilfered off the internet, so I don't know, hopefully we've not doing the wrong thing here so this um anyone seen those in the garden and what are they yeah hungry caterpillars <laughs> yes the very hungry caterpillar uh yeah then they these ones are the white cabbage moth larvae and they'll they'll come and eat your pretty much everything well, i've had them on mint um uh, they're on a radish over there we'll show you and and cabbages of course a lot of your brassicas and they come and they they uh they eat what do you do what what do you do with them if you've got a cap yeah so feed them to the birds. yeah so so Bob's saying you feed them to the birds you can just squash them they, they don't they don't run away so they're very easy just to squish um the chicken says chris feed them to the chickens they're awesome chicken food chickens love them um i'm not sure what the next slide is but before i go there i'll tell you the story of my mint plant so i had a mint plant on the back deck really healthy beautiful lush looking mint in a in a pot i went out one day i must have missed a couple of days and it was basically a bunch of sticks and really fat green caterpillars and um you know i 
it was a it was a good learning curve for me because I decided that I put on my organic you know, permaculture pest management hat and I didn't do anything. I didn't squash them. I didn't spray them. Even though you, know, you have this sort of emotional response when something just massive is your plant. Um, but what I did, I sat down next to it and I saw these little black flies, maybe half a dozen of them, just flying around the mint plant. And I noticed one of them flew down and landed on a caterpillar and kind of jabbed it with its back end. I thought, wow, that's really kind of weird and interesting. So I did, did my research and it turns out that there's a whole range of these little, they're called parasitic wasps. So the little wasps, they're not interested in humans, they don't hurt you. But what they do, they lay their eggs inside caterpillars and the larvae of the wasp grows inside the caterpillar and eats it. It keeps it alive. Apparently they, they don't eat the important bits. So this poor caterpillar's still got a you know, its heart still going and it's still alive and it just eats the rest of it. And then when they're um when they're ready to turn into moss, they pop out and they they make their little you know, cocoons or whatever and then they'll they'll grow into moths and uh, wasps and kind of disappear so there's a suggestion that you might use dye pellet mm. and i guess this might be a reason why you might not yeah so if so dye pellet is a yeah 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 so dye pellet is a um it's a fairly safe one of the one of our tools that you could use i guess you'd put it in the chemical tools kind of category so sprays are, are a tool um, and it's only specific to caterpillars. So it's not going to really hurt anything else except your parasitic wasps. So if you spray Dipel, get rid of all your caterpillars, you won't have the privilege of having parasitic wasps living in your garden and killing your caterpillars for you. So what happened at my place was by doing nothing, these wasps did their thing that they just do naturally. And then I had a whole family of little parasitic wasps flying around my garden. And we... Honestly, we don't have, this was years ago, and um, we just we don't have green, we, green caterpillars are not a major problem in our garden. They come and they go, but they've never been a, a really big problem. And I think part of that is the, this, we have this wasp population living in the garden that just cleans them up. So, um, yeah. Does, does dipel hurt bees? Uh, well, dipel, I think it's a, and Jan will know this, uh, any of you guys who've done horticulture, I think it's either a bacteria or a virus-based thing, maybe a bacteria. Yeah, well, basically the research that i done uh, suggested that it's an organic bacteria-based, especially targeting caterpillars, and it's safe to others. But I'm not, I don't want to say that it does nothing to bees. I'm not 100% sure right now, but I'm quite positive it's safe to bees, but I wouldn't just, you know, I wouldn't rule it out. Probably, yeah. 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 And I think that's a fairly wise approach. You know, they, everyone tells you their product is safe. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. So that's, but that's a, an interesting, uh, really interesting thing to have happen in your garden. We've got them living here. Uh, we've seen the carcasses of poor little green cabbage moss with bits of things poking out of them all over the place. So, so that's one thing. Um, these guys, uh, yes, mealy bugs. So the big, the big white ones, they're mealy bug. Um, they're they're another pest. So they're a sap sucker, very common. Um, has anyone seen this? These little guys around. The the it's like a little ladybird type type thing. I think it must be related. Uh, and it's actually called Cryptolamus ladybug, and it eats mealy bugs. So the photo on the left, um, the big fluffy thing, that's a mealy bug, and the little fluffy thing is actually the larvae of the cryptolamus, and it disguises itself, well, it, it looks like a mealy bug, so the mealy bugs don't recognize it, they think it's one of their mates, and then it comes up and eats them. So it's an interesting kind of evolutionary kind of process, and here you can see them interacting um, and you can tell, well, we can tell the difference between the mealybug and the predator. So this is this to me is a really good example of uh, what can happen when you spray, even if you spray, uh, you know, organic, harm, harmless kind of 
like oil based products like an eco oil or something if you sprayed these things that you think are all pests what happens everything dies yeah exactly everything dies so that's um that's a we'll just let that hang um this is these are mites so these things are barely a millimeter long and they often you get they're fairly common again they live on the underside of a lot of the plants of the leaves of a lot of plants the one on the, the orange one actually the one on the right the black one is two spotted mite it's a pest the one on the left is a predatory mite that feeds on the one on the right so even on that tiny little scale you've got these predator prey things going on so again you spray you kill them all okay some of you will know what this is what is it Anyone recognize this? If you saw it, okay, if you saw it on your plant, um, what's your reaction? So th this is good, this is good. It was killing aphids on the almond trees, if I remember correctly, but I can't remember yeah. the name. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We videoed here. We got a great video of uh, this, one of the, a few of these guys walking around eating aphids. Does anyone know what this is? The ladybug, right? So, and you can see um, on the leaf, you've got the, there's lots of aphid carcasses. So ladybugs devour aphids. They're really voracious eaters of aphids. So one of our good bugs, and that's the larvae. So that weird looking thing is the larvae of the ladybug. And the larvae just smash aphids like you wouldn't, they, they just walk around and just munch them. So really good to have ladybugs in your garden. Um, and I think the question, hopefully that you know it might be generating is um how do we get these guys to come and live and stay in the garden because that's really the the strategy here okay what's this <laughs> what does Another it look like caterpillar. Looks like caterpillar. A, maybe a butterfly is it going to turn into a butterfly? Yeah, it looks a lot like, um, it looks a bit like a green cabbage moth larvae that we saw before, or some sort of caterpillar. Uh, I don't know if you can see on your devices, but if you look in closely at the, the top end, um, there's something going on there. So it's, it's oh, like, yeah. as, um, so what it is, oh, has anyone seen these around their garden? They're pretty common. They kind of, they hover. Like they go from, they often go from flower, one flower to another and they sort of hover, hover, hover. Um, they're called, funnily enough, hover flies. Um, and they eat, they eat nectar and they're really good for, for pollinating. And their larvae is that guy. And the larvae uh, eats aphids and various other things. So they're actually, it's a predator. It's a good, a good bug. To look at it at a glance, it looks like a caterpillar, and you'd probably squash it. Um, but they're actually different. So I've actually I've seen these guys. I had a mustard again on my deck. Had a mustard plant, beautiful looking mustard plant. Got covered in aphids one day. Um, and again, I did nothing, but I watched the watch the hoverflies flying around, and they they'll hover and they'll they take ages, and they're looking around, looking around, and then they'll fly down, and they'll you can watch them lay their eggs on the leaf in amongst the aphids. A few days later, a whole bunch of these green larvae hatched, and um, you can, I could tell that they were hoverfly larvae as opposed to caterpillars because what they do, they they plant their back end. You can see the big fat back end, and then their front end sort of goes like a windscreen wiper across the leaf, and it just picks off picks off aphids. And you can see where they've been. They sort of leave this track where there's no aphids, and they just kind of go around. It's fascinating to watch. Um, I've seen them lots and lots of times. Um, in various gardens, uh, laying their eggs in amongst aphids. So they're really, they're a good bug. So they're a, a pollinator, so they give you more fruit and they also um, pick up the aphids for you. How are we going for time? Thank you, we're good. Okay, this is an interesting one. What What is this? Kind of, yeah. So at, Anyone, anyone want to hazard a, I mean, it's, it's, it's a caterpillar, right? So it's, it's, 
It's a caterpillar. A butterfly caterpillar. Yeah. So this is an interesting one, I think, from a pet, from an, uh, just, you know, from a permaculture or a, um, ecological management perspective, because in its current form, it's uh, it's technically a pest because it's eating our plants. Um, so so maybe so you got to decide what you're going to do with it, um, and there are a few different things that you can do with it. Oh, what what, could, what would you do if you saw this guy on your plant? What's the what's the thinking behind what you're going to do? Any thought? That's a bit of a broad question, isn't it? Um, what what would you do? Yeah. So Bob had a question: Is it eating? Is it eating what you want to eat? So that's probably the first sort of thinking process: is is this thing a problem, or is it just something living in my garden? So is it eating too much? Do I need to actually do anything? Um, if you decide that you're going to do something, what could you do? And we'll, Julian will talk about, what, I think in the second, next week or the week after, we'll, we'll explore more about the that, this sort of idea. But um, so we've got a few contributions, you know. Um, it's pretty, so so they might leave it. Yeah. Um, leave it and enjoy the butterflies later. Yeah. Remove it. Yeah. Question depends on how many there are. Yeah. So that that's a really good point. Like, is are there so many that they're just going to decimate your whole garden, and you probably can't live with that? Or is there one or two, and you just watch them, uh, watch them turn into that, which someone's you know wait till it turns into a butterfly. If you have one of these in your garden, uh, you know this is what it's all about to me. You, if one of these flies through your garden, it's just it's a magical moment. You know, it's a, it's a beyond food. It's kind of one of those wow wow kind of moment so and that's really special so if you kill all the caterpillars you don't get that moment you don't get that that animal what else is that animal doing apart from making us feel wonderful it's pollinating so they'll go from flower to flower and give us more fruit so it's an interesting question and this is you know as a, a when you're managing pests in your garden at one stage of its life cycle, potentially it's a problem. Another stage of its life cycle, it's a real benefit. So, you know, it's not as cut and dried as just kill everything. So this is here. What can you see there? A couple of little... Count the frogs. I think there's only two. So there's, so these little frogs, they live here. Uh, they're, a lot of you guys have probably seen them. They're about that big. Uh, little dwarf, pygmy, eastern green tree frog or something like that and they're really cute and they make this cute little noise what are they doing up and just sitting there what else do they do yes. yep yep so they're great at eating insects and pests so one of our one of the good guys now you would have seen yeah <laughs> um blue Did you see our one from here no, this is just an internet. <laughs> but, you know, it could be one from here. You've all seen them here. Um, what do they do? Eat snails. Eat snails, yep. So they're massive consumers of snails. A bit hard to see in that picture, but that, that's a blue tongue eating a snail. We've got families of blue tongues living here. We don't have any snails. So I don't know if any of you guys have seen snails here at all. But I'm sure that the blue tongues, and if you do a survey of people with, blue tongues in their garden and without you can you can see the difference in the snail population will we go into how to attract a blue tongue to your garden i think we will yeah, yeah. yeah. today <laughs> yeah um even these little guys these little skinks they're everywhere they're really common um i've seen uh actually we had a workshop series and someone brought in a video of of one of these guys sitting on their windowsill consuming a, a, a green caterpillar that was almost the same size as it it was a quite an interesting video but it was um yeah you know they'll they'll run through your garden pick off pests and and so it's all part of that complexity um little wrens you know we're so lucky we're lucky here that we've got a whole population of wrens in the in the forest just next door and they if you come here at the right time in the morning or in the evening, they'll they'll come through the garden and pick off pick off pests and and that's a great food source for them and it's a great resource for us. So if you can, you know, do something in your garden to attract to attract little birds, little insectivorous birds, they'll help you with pest management. All right. So um, 
don't know if these guys are still around and whether we should be promoting them, but they, you can actually buy beneficial insects and get them sent to you in the mail and you open up your package and, and open up the you know, your container and away they go into your garden with the idea that they'll help clean up some of your, um, your pests. The question is, if they just, if you let them go and they go out, eat some pests and then there's nothing else for them, what happens? They just, they're gone. They go somewhere else. And I think Andrew mentioned that in his video. He, he, he got hold of a couple of ladybugs to, to live in his garden, but they didn't stay. So, um, so I think the theme of, of today is how, you know, how do we get all of these, this, this diversity of good, well, we call them good, um, predatory animals that will come and live in your garden and make pest management not an issue for you. So you won't have the pests out of control in the first place. Um, I think there might be, I'll just let that question hang because I think that's the topic of, of the breakout group. But I just want to tell you one last story. Uh, my, when one of my kids was about two, she was out in the garden with her uncle playing around in the ground, in the dirt as they, as they do and um <coughs> excuse me they both came running in really excited and they said oh look come, come, look, look at this look at this and show me show me this little hole that they dug and they found a little bunch of these eggs um does anyone recognize what they are have you seen these before there it's a bit hard to tell from a photo but um Frog? They look a bit like, yeah, they look, they look a lot like frog's eggs, but they're actually in the ground. So, um, turns out after I didn't know what they were, so I did my research. They are, they are leopard slug eggs. Okay. So, um, has anyone seen bees in their garden? And if you did see one of these, what would you do? <laughs> I mean, it's a slug, right? <laughs> I know it's a trick question. Um, these leopard slugs are really easy to identify through their markings. They're very distinctive and they're big. They can get like really big, big slugs and they are actually carnivorous. So these slugs eat snails and they eat other slugs. Um, so they're good. These are, these are part of our army of good guys that are going to help clean up slugs and snails. So, um, you know, um, what was I going to say? One, you know, the year that we had one year where these things were everywhere through my backyard. They were just, I don't know why, but there were lots of them. And we were still growing little seedlings and our seedlings weren't getting eaten. So I'm assuming they don't eat your seedlings just from that experience. Um, but they, I definitely know that they eat um, snails and slugs. So, so I think that for me was a really good lesson in actually not, not just killing things because you think they're bad just to take just to step back and say okay what am i looking at identify it and then then make a decision on what you want to do um, and i guess also thinking um there's been some questions you know we will go into how do we track all sorts of beneficials later on but i guess you know picking up a few a, a boy and a girl leopard slug is probably easier than trying to attract a uh, blue tongue Oh, yeah, it could be, depending on your context. Yeah, blue tongues are surprisingly common. Okay. But yeah, so yeah, well, um, and leopard slugs are as well. So yeah, I think they're both equally, both. equally. <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, yeah, so let's, um, so that, yeah, how do, how do we get these guys living in your garden? So um, I think we'll go into our, our what are they called? Break, break up, breakout rooms. Um, not break up rooms, breakout rooms. <laughs> and um, just thinking about your garden, um, in in the context of your garden, maybe just have a quick chat about some of the things that you you might have seen in the garden over over the years or over the the weeks, and um, and have a chat about what what you what things you think you could add to your garden to start attracting. And having a lot of these predators, these good bugs, uh, these other animals living uh, in your garden. Does that make sense? Yep. Now, the breakout rooms will have three or four people each. You'll have six minutes in total. Um, what would be great is that 
you make sure that everybody in the group gets a chance to contribute. And when we come back, we'll ask each group to share one idea from your group. So you've got six minutes, which is a bit more spacious. Uh, so perhaps also figure out before the warning comes that um, who's, who's going to contribute and what, what item are you going to contribute? Okay, see you soon. This is when that tool comes into it. Hello. Hello, we're just waiting for everyone to come back. We're all back now. Oh, good. Welcome back. Do you want to... um, all right, so how did you go? If we start with uh, what group have we got? Julian? Oops, I forgot to keep track of the groups. So let's see, <laughs> could Chris or Amanda report back, please? Hi, um, I really, yeah, I'm Amanda. Uh, we, Chris and I sort of talked about um, how to affect in general more kind of different kind of bugs and stuff that um, you, you need to probably have more variety of plants like in terms of native plants in the garden. Um, mm -hmm. And I was saying I used to have lots of snails, but I, <laughs> I don't have um, them anymore and I'm not quite sure. I don't think I've got a blue tongue lizard unless there is one and I don't know it's there or something. Um, yeah. So I'm not quite sure why they sort of disappeared, but there must be something different in my garden happening that I don't know about. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, cool. It's off in the way. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in Helen's group, please, report that. Yeah, and you want to go all uh... Jan? You can go, Helen, it's fine. Okay, all right. Uh, what did we talk about? We talked about calendulas in particular. Um, I, I imagine it's just a diversity of plants, flowering plants, um, to attract pollinators. Also, um, uh, strongly scented plants to, de to um, um, deter confused pests. Um, and then we also discussed stink bugs and how hard it is to um, avoid pesticides. <laughs> yes. Yeah, those sticky things that live on your citrus and squirt acid at you, they're, they're another thing altogether. We'll talk about those uh, in the next couple of weeks. For and sure. we, yeah. we thought maybe with blue tongue lizards, it would be leaf litter. Mm. Leaf yep. litter? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh, somebody in Nikki's group, or the group that had Nikki in it. <laughs> I'll go quickly. Um, it was me and, and Jean, and we also we also spoke a bit about diversity and about not you know not just having one particular thing. Didn't focus on natives particularly though. So I'd be interested to know if that is that also a factor in it. Okay. Thank you, Nicola. And then somebody in the remaining group. Uh, I think that's us. We kind of got stuck talking about what pests we had. But, you know, we, someone thought, yeah, stink bugs. But she wasn't sure. And someone else um, thought something's attacking her oregano, but she wasn't sure what. So it makes it a bit hard to know what to do when you're not even sure what it is attacking your plant. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and that's actually a really good, good point. I think it's um, part of the part of the process of managing pests. It's really important uh, to know actually what you're dealing with. So, and that can be the challenge. Sometimes you never see them, but you just see the damage. So, um, but we'll uh, we'll get into that more detail later. So, attracting um, attracting the good guys. So, you guys mentioned what did we have? We had flowers, leaf litter, diversity. So we'll, we'll, we'll take you through a walk, uh, for a walk through the garden here and just show you some of the strategies that we've put in place and show you some of the things that, um, that we've got here. And I think um, one thing about this garden is we, we don't, yeah, it, it, it yeah, anyway, let's, we'll go and have a look. Come on. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, so uh, one of the first things we wanted to show you, um, and a few of you guys have mentioned, is uh, is the diversity. So that old chestnut, uh, diversity, diversity, diversity. Um, you know, permaculture principle, use and value diversity. So that's um, that is a key to attracting to attracting good bug, good well, good anything to your garden. So it's diversity in plants, diversity in um, a lot of different things in the landscape. Um, one thing that you might notice with the gardens here uh, is another idea with diversity, and we talked about it, I think, when we were talking about planting planting out last week, is that idea of stacking. So you might have tall plants, sort of lower plants, some ground covers, um, and that that stacking um, provides lots of homes for lots of different animals. So you know, if you've got that multi-dimensional garden and plants at all the different levels you instantly increase the uh well i mean it's habitat so we're talking about creating habitat for for uh for, for the for the things that are come and live in your garden so one of the things is diversity so lots of different things um and i don't you know i think you can see that that for yourselves and if you've been here you'll see the diversity that we use and also that layering of the garden even in a veggie garden context if you've got different layers you've got more habitat for the good bugs so that's one thing um, flowers a few of you guys mentioned flowers so it's kind of almost winter so it's not a profuse you know we don't have masses of flowers but we do have some um, and we always try and have something flowering. So this this is uh, borage. Borage is really a really pretty flower. You can actually eat it, uh, and it's you know it, it's a sort of plant that seems to flower quite a lot. Um, uh, what else have we got? Marigolds, which you can probably see in the background here. Um, these things are always flowering. They just self seed. They grow a bit like a weed. So they're marigolds. This little plant here, I'm not actually sure what it is, but it could be carrots. Um, so I'll, I'll actually pick this one because I wanted to talk about that the certain, <laughs> certain, certain types of flowers can, um, are actually really good at attracting beneficial insects. So this, this is, let's assume it's something like a carrot, um, but you can see the way that this is actually a heap and you know, lots of different flowers all together in one flower head. And you can see the shape of that flower head is something a little bit like an umbrella. Um, and it's umbel umbelliferous, I think is the technical term, but any, I'll hold it there. There we go. That's better. Um, so anything that flower holds its flowers like that, seems to be particularly useful at attracting beneficial a lot of beneficial insects particularly like ladybugs and hoverflies and all sorts of things so for some reason this type of flower seems to be good but the benefit of that is a lot of your flower the plants will have flowers of that shape so parsley carrots um, coriander a lot of your herbs when they flower they put out flowers like this and they're fantastic for um, attracting the good bugs. All right. there we go. Um, actually, just behind us, oh, uh, this this beauty here is a carrot. So this is what carrots look like when they go to flower. Um, they get masses of flowers on them, and these are that that umbelliferous shape again, which mm. is really good for attracting the good bugs. So, so letting your herbs and veggies go to flower is actually a really good thing for your pest management because it will attract a lot of good bugs to the garden. Um, so yeah, so in your veggies or in your garden as a whole, um, lots of flowers. If you can manage to get something flowering all year, uh, that's great. And if you manage to get lots of things flowering all year, that's even better. Um, so then when you do, um, actually don't buy ladybugs because you're wasting your money. They will come. But if you did, you know, release your ladybugs into your garden, they will stay if you've got all these flowers there for them. So a lot of the, it's a really important part of the strategy. Um, so another thing that actually attracts a lot of uh, life to the garden um, is something really simple like um, 
and it's part of our soil building strategy, which is uh, leaf litter or mulch on the top. So those little little skinks that we showed you a photo of, they love hanging out in your mulch. So I'll just create a home in there. So this this is just a part of the garden where we throw stuff. Okay, so <laughs> it's very technical and very complex, but we throw stuff and it just it sits on the surface. Um, we throw it here because bananas love it. You know, you just we throw things in the middle of this banana circle and it breaks down, but it provides really good habitat. I guarantee our blue tongues have cruised through here at some stage and um, frogs love this sort of stuff and little lizards love this sort of stuff. So um, if it's not this sort of messy that you like, even just mulch like straw or sugar cane mulch is really good habitat for for a lot of your um, predatory animals in the garden. So, so the mulch is another thing. Ah, I'll show you something else. Um, it may not be that easy to see, but under under here, and you guys probably know, so this is actually a pond. So under these seats, there's a pond uh, with some water plants. And ponds are amazing uh, in their habitat value. So if you can find a spot for even a small pond, some sort of water in the garden you'll get things like dragonflies and frogs and lizards and you know so much more life so much more diversity will be attracted to your to a pond so uh, and you can set up a pond uh with so it's really productive you can actually grow my understanding is you can grow more food uh, in water than you can on land per square meter so you can, there's a lot of edible plants that you grow in a pond, but the real benefit, I think, well, one of the real benefits is that habitat. So, um, and you can set them up so you don't get mosquitoes and they look after themselves. So maybe we'll do a setting up a pond workshop at some stage, but it's um, yeah, worth thinking about and doing your research. And if you can find a spot, even a small um, so put um, you, well, I will go, oh, we'll go this way. <laughs> so um, when, we were, when we were here last week, it was a bit warmer. I think it was last week or the week before, or the week before, and we, Julian posted a photo of the blue tongue, the massive blue tongue that lives here. And they live, they actually go underneath this bridge. And so they hang out under here, they hang out underneath the bridge over there. They've got lots of cover with these plants in the swales. Um, when we were here, the blue tongue kind of walked along this rill, um, walked along here and kind of went under that, under that bridge there. So if you want to attract, you know, one way to attract blue tongues um, to your garden and other lizards and things is create those hollows, create a hiding spot for them. Yeah, they might be, might be a bit slow today because it's quite cold. But I think they seem to come out in winter. And oh, the other thing they like is um, is rocks and co concrete. So somewhere safe where they can get away from things like dogs and cats, uh, and somewhere to have a sun a sun bake, which is um, it's really all you need. And then a good supply of snails, so if you, you'll get blue tongues uh, coming and living in your garden. So um, I guess the theme with that is, you know, if you're if you're an animal, or if we are, okay, we need uh, food, shelter water <laughs> <What's that? laughs> air yeah so so, so yeah so, so think about yeah so food shelter and um you know so safe they can eat they can drink and i guess somewhere to make babies to produce the next generation so if you can provide those things for as many different animals as you can um fabulous and we might yeah yeah. Um, all right. So one last thing. So I just wanted to show you this one last thing. One thing that you that your predators need is a 
food source. So some of them will eat nectar out of the flowers, but they need uh, they need pests. So that's not helpful. Yeah, look at that. So there is a, this is a classic example of a plant that is well and truly finished its life cycle and it's covered in aphids. And it's also, I um, don't know if you can see that little caterpillar there. There you go. So it's got, um, it's got the cabbage moth. So there's one there, there's one there. There's, there's a, quite a few, oh look, look at that. When you start looking, these things are everywhere. It's hard to see. So there's one, yeah. There's a caterpillar, caterpillar, lots of damage. We're running out of power. Um, we'll be back with the camera in just a second. The battery's about to go. You guys hear me? Yep. Yep, we can. I don't know if it's, I think it's yep. through the computer now. So, um, uh, yeah, so we were just showing you. Have we got a camera? Is that, is that the camera? No. no just a still of the yep. garden. Okay. Not a video. Oh. Um, oh, okay, sorry, probably, that's the wrong way around. <laughs> so look, anyway, you, you probably saw, saw, yeah, you probably saw the caterpillars and the aphids on this, um, on this radish. Um, so I wanted to finish on that because it, 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 it might sort of talk to some of the questions that you guys had around, um, well, it leads into the next next part of the topic. You know, you, you can set up your ecosystem, you can have lots of diversity and all of this great habitat for, for the beneficial insects and the good bugs and the lizards and the frogs and the birds. Come and live in your garden, do most of the work for you and save you all the hassle of having to manage pests yourself. Uh, but you will uh, invariably get pests coming to your garden and doing damage. So I guess the question is when you're when you're deciding what to do um, in that context is you know there's a, there's a there's a lot to it there's a lot of thinking behind it what do you actually do in this circumstance where you've got aphids and caterpillars um, eating your plant so what i do in this context and it will be different for different contexts but here this is a this is a radish or it was a radish uh, and it's finished its life cycle. So we're, we're not gonna get any food out of this particular plant uh, because we didn't actually harvest the radish when it was edible. Um, so I'm not gonna do anything. So what I'm looking at here is a fantastic food source for parasitic wasps, for uh, ladybugs, for lizards, you know, all of those good guys that are going to come and live in our garden. So this is like a, this is a food source for them. So they will find these critters and they will move in and they will finish them off. Um, and if this plant gets decimated, it doesn't matter because it's, you know, its service to the ecosystem is to provide food for the beneficial insects. Okay, we're going to swap camera. Okay, we're swapping camera. <laughs> Oh, 
will have, to, have to be via chat, chat, I guess. Unless Barb can hear. Hello, Barb. Hi, Okay, I think I should be able to hear you. Okay, so you can, can you hear me now? Oh, great. Yay. 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 I see you. Sorry about that. I was just, um, I can't hear you still. Uh, so it's just, just putting it out. If anyone had any questions at this stage, we're kind of finished. Um, it's 11 o'clock, so we're technically done, but I think we've probably got time to field a few questions if anyone did have any questions. But you will need to type the questions. You just need to type them. We're getting lots of thank yous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, what we'll do, we normally do a round robin sort of at this stage. Uh, we might leave that until the next session. And at the beginning of the next session, we'll just do a round robin of something you remember from today. That's right. And next week is still pest management. So hopefully there's lots of unanswered questions. Um, but the really, I think for me, the most important part of pest management is looking at your garden like that, you know, using that ecosystem model and working with it because it really does, it, it makes your life so much easier and more interesting. Hmm. Um, so that's the starting point of pest management next week. Yeah, next week in particular, we're gonna be looking at how to read your plants. So the, the leaf pattern that occurs, if it's not just pure green, um, can actually tell you a lot about what's going on in the soil. So obviously it's a bit of um, eco-literacy, just being able to read your plants and see what that means. Um, so thank you. I found it really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I can tell everyone else did, especially comments about how alien-esque some of the things going on were, oh, you know. know. They're freaky, aren't they? Caterpillars <laughs> popping out of caterpillars. Um, so look, I uh, hope you enjoyed this one. Please come to the next one. Let people know about it. And also we'd really appreciate it if you filled in the survey at the end of this. Thanks guys, have a good week. See you later. See ya. Bye bye.